Hello everyone, I'm Annie Gibbons and you're listening to Memoirs of Successful Women, the podcast where you get to hear candid conversations with fascinating women from around the globe who share aspects of their business and life journey, how they measure their success and what they have learnt along the way. Today, I'd like to introduce you to Julia Serafine, who is a highly sought after social media prodigy, an expert in her field who started her social media career at only nine years of age. Due to Julia's extreme talent at such a young age, she is considered a prodigy of social media. And now at 21, she's a highly in-demand social media consultant and former social media manager who ran more than 70 accounts. She's also an influencer with more than 50,000 combined followers over social media and is also the founder of jewellery retail brand, Princess Gem Store. So welcome to the program, Julia. Hi, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. How does someone at the age of 21 come on a podcast program and go, you know what, I'm owning my space uh, in social media, making an impact in the world. How did you become a champion in this space? Uh, according to your bio by the age, you know, starting at the age of nine. Yeah, so I started all the way back when I was nine years old on a social media site called Roblox, where users can design in-game clothing, have their own games on the website, and have their own little groups. And I had a fashion group, and I learned the native advertising platform on Roblox's website, and I was able to get my group to be the second largest on the site. (laughs) And I was also able to sell thousands of clothes, and I was able to get more than 100,000 visits to my game. And Incredible. that was all, that was a huge start for me. Yeah. So what would unpack that for me and definitely our listeners? What are you, you're a nine-year-old girl thinking I can do something online. I can sort of, you know, was it about selling products? It was a making a name for yourself. Was it learning the technology? You know, what, what did it involve? I guess for me, when I was that age, my main goal was just fashion, like how to be the most fashionable person that I can be on the site. Mm -hmm. And I realized that to be able to kind of like share my fashion with others, I had to spread the word about it. And I didn't realize it until I looked up how other people have their advertisements on the site. But I was actually really good at picking up like the whole ad testing, conversions, creating graphics. I really like my professors referred to me as a social media prodigy for this reason, that I was able to learn all this advertising and social media so young. Mm. But my main goal was really the fashion. And do you come from a family who was interested in fashion or is that just your thing? That's just my thing. But if you listen to my mom, she'll definitely say that she's a lot more fashionable than I am. (laughs) (laughs) Classic. Absolutely classic. Okay. So what sort of um, sites were you using to mentor you or you were just exploring your own growth in that area? Do you feel like you're in a designing, you know, innovating into a new new area yourself and creating that space? Or did you have key, key people or websites that you were following at that stage? I guess when I was really young, it was mostly just Roblox, but there were also a few other forums that I was a big uh, contributor to. Mm -hmm. I can't remember them off the top of my head because it's been more than a decade, but I'm sure if you showed me them, I would remember them in a second. (laughs) Okay, so you're becoming more and more successful and you're this, you know, 9, 10, 11 year old girl who's suddenly just creating all these sales and getting a bit of a following in this space. Around when I was 10, I would say my parents were really like interested in everything that I had to do and my family in general. They thought that I was so like intelligent at such a young age and that I had so much accomplished already and just I was just a child. Yeah. And they noticed that I was advertising, I was creating key partnerships with other uh, users on the site who were also in fashion. I was overtaking all of these larger groups on the site. And I was becoming kind of a household name on the site at the time. 
Okay. And what concerns did they have? I'm assuming most parents would be having some concerns, your legal concerns, responsibilities, what contracts were you taking um, with different people? Uh, did you know what you were signing? Did they know what they were signing? Do you know what I mean? Did they have those normal parental concerns? Did they guide you in that way? Or did they just go, you know what, we'll just leave it to Julia? <laughs> My mom was really concerned about the amount of screen time I was spending, and yeah. I shared the computer with my brother at the time, and they were concerned that I was hogging the computer so that my brother couldn't use it. Yeah. And, like, me and my brother eventually came to an understanding where we would, like, take turns on the computer, but that was really the only concern that my parents had was that I was just spending way too much time on the computer for a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Do you think it did impact your schoolwork? How did that go? Or did you, was it more that you went to school and then every other hour was spent on your business? I guess I really only worked on the business online when I was home from school. Yeah. Like when I was at school, it was all just like work, 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 all this and all that. Yeah. And then when I got home, it was all like Roblox work, social media work. Yeah. And so what did your friends think at that time? He must have been, you know, early, early high school and they've got a real entrepreneur as a friend. Actually, it was still middle school when I was like ending my time on the site. Okay. It wasn't until like high school that I kind of got into the mainstream social media sites and really started to branch out. Okay. But back in middle school, my friends were like really thrilled. <laughs> yeah, I bet I they were. Parties on the website. And <laughs> and they were the, you were the cool kids yeah I'd like to say so but I guess being a cool kid on the internet doesn't really equate to being a cool kid in real life no that's right different worlds different worlds so talk us through then the the next few years what happened then in high school and what sorts of uh, projects did you get involved and what did you achieve let's see in high school I kind of just wiped my hands of the whole social media thing because I had gotten sick of it because mm -hmm. I had become this person that was so obsessed with success at such a young age that it was becoming unhealthy for me. Right. And I quit because I was letting all the pressure get to my head and it was starting to become too unhealthy for someone as young as me to have as much power and control that I did. Mm -hmm. So I took a break and I worked on school I had bad grades at first because I was transitioning from like being an internet kid to being a real life kid. <laughs> but I eventually went on to become the president of two clubs at my uh, high school. I was the president of the Arts Honor Society and the French Club. I graduated with high honors despite having a traumatic brain injury senior year of uh, high school. And I won the award for most motivated student in the art department. I also won several scholarships, including one for my friend who was tragically taken away way um, too young. Her name is uh, Marin Sanchez. Yeah. And I won a scholarship on her behalf, which was a huge honor. <laughs> Absolutely huge honor. Oh my goodness. Well, you, you're certainly an amazing girl and it shows that with a great mind like that and a great ability and natural skill set, you know, it's probably not surprising that you did start at such a young age because you certainly had an inquisitive nature about how things work and, and wanting to achieve things. Uh, how did you receive a brain injury in your final year? That's all pretty traumatic. So uh, my boyfriend, he comes from the Philippines and he has a special needs brother and I um, kind of met his brother when I was volunteering as a mentor for special needs kids at school. Mm -hmm. And I knew Edwin, which is his brother's name, for a long time, a lot longer than I had known my boyfriend. And I realized that because they were from the Philippines, they had never gone sledding before. And I thought that would be a really nice sensory experience for someone with autism to partake yeah. in. So... I took uh, Edwin and my boyfriend sledding near the school mm -hmm. and I went over an icy patch that was uneven and I hit my head and it bounced up and down a few times on a really thick piece of ice. Oh my goodness. And when I went to the doctor, they said that I was only in the 16th percentile for cognitive ability because I had become so brain damaged. Mm. But luckily 
through intensive physical therapy, a lot of tears and a lot of uh, upset feelings, I was able to overcome it. And it took more than a year to heal. But <sighs> before I was done, I was actually tested again for cognitive ability. And it turns out that despite still being brain damaged, I was already up to the 94th percentile for cognitive ability for my age. <laughs> <laughs> so I would love to see where I'm at now that I'm fully healed, but that yeah. felt pretty impressive to me. <laughs> it's incredibly impressive. And oh, what a what a gutsy time to be able to, you know, at that this stage of your life to be able to, you know, to be in rehab and to be going through that process. It must have been incredibly frustrating and uh, well done you for doing all the hard work and, and, and coming back. Um, but it actually stretched through my first year of college right. and um, it wasn't until like halfway through college like my first year that I started doing social media again that I had gotten back into it mm. and studying for all those years like I studied from the beginning of college all the way until like actually I'm still studying social media because being a social media expert means that you never really know anything <laughs> Or you never really know everything, I should say. But okay. now so, I'm considered a social media expert. Terrific. So how, what, what was actually happening to you at the early, beginning of college? So what, what degree did you enroll in? So I enrolled in liberal arts and I ended up getting an associate's degree for that. And I also received a certificate for entrepreneurship and another certificate for fashion retail management. Okay. So those early years did suddenly come, come to, to be, didn't they? So you were always interested in fashion. You had a great experience being able to sell that online through social media. You've had a few years off and then now you've sort of come back and went, oh, okay, well, I'm going to get back into it at university and really start honing my craft. Yeah. And I realised that, like, being an influencer is all about like sharing my passion for all of this like fashion that I have. And it's really nice to have an audience that appreciates all of this like insight that I have. And I am planning on sharing social media tips with my audience as well as fashion advice and cool outfits that I come up with. Okay. So how did you become, you know, there's so many people who think they're great at social media. How do you confidently um, call yourself a social media expert and an influencer? What does that mean in a global way? So I guess for me, I studied for years on end tirelessly for hours every single day on every algorithm for every social media site all of the psychology behind all the sites, how the sites work, how people interact with the sites and with each other on the sites, how to market their content in a way that'll get them as much engagement as possible. And I ended up running more than 70 accounts as a social media manager in college. And I've had clients from all over the world, even Japan. And I recently did the switch to consulting because my time was so hard pressed. <laughs> that like I would spend hours for each client every day and I didn't have time to do anything else. Yeah. And it got to the point where I was just so exhausted. I realized that I could do a lot more good if I just did consulting. Hmm. Exactly. We all get to that stage where you sort of, you want to be, you want to be booked out. And then when you are booked out, it's like, I can't clone myself. How, what, you know, what, what do I do now? So amazing that you've already achieved that. So let's talk about your clients then. What are their biggest challenges? Why do they come to you? Let's see. One of my clients had a problem gaining followers. And that's always hard for everybody, especially for newer accounts like I've worked with. Like, especially people who start in the hundreds, like gaining new followers, people, they think like, oh, if I post, then I'll gain followers and that'll be enough. Yeah. But in reality, it's more about the marketing behind it and the content that you come up with that's backed up by the marketing efforts. It's not just posting, it's everything behind the scenes. And I actually learned a lot about that in Roblox too, because like, Sure, I had great clothes on the site, but nobody would find out about them if I didn't advertise them. Yeah. So for that client, 
I said we would do influencer marketing and I gave advice on how to create better content. And sadly enough, their content didn't really improve, but my marketing efforts kept going up and up and up. And it was at that point, like from that one client that I realized if the content doesn't get any better, then people are gonna come from the marketing efforts, see something they don't like, and then not follow. Yeah. So you're honed in there, yeah, there's multiple touch points. They all have to be at peak performance. Otherwise, you know, that's right. One, first of all, you don't attract the people that you're wanting to attract and then you might attract them, but then not be able to deliver or, or um, be unimpressive by the product that you're, you're offering. Yeah, like if the impressions go up from your marketing efforts, but you're not gaining any new followers, that's a sign that your content might not be up to par. <laughs> Which is really devastating because everyone sort of behind their product is, you know, they love it. They live and breathe it. It's their baby that they want to offer to market and they're so proud of it. So it feels, it feels almost upsetting for them to go, you know, if it wants everybody, I, I have people tell me this all the time. If they only knew what I offer, you know, it'd be a no brainer. They would love it, but they can't hook them. And that's because of the world that you're in that that's right. You've got to one, make yourself known. And then two, be able to make sure that the, the first taste of you represent what they actually would receive if they got more of you or your product is that a good summary yeah I would say so okay. everything has to be as optimal as possible okay so talk us through a client then who has really excelled with your service offerings what how did it change their world of business hmm. I guess I would have to say now this is a humble brag that yeah. the person who's improved best from my efforts is actually myself mm -hmm. because I guess for me, like I have all the time in the world to work on myself and my account, but I've done so much searching from my own expertise, new knowledge that comes to me and all the research that I do. And I just take this and I compartmentalize it and I put it to as best use as possible. And I guess for no client, can I give them all the advice that I have in one sitting? But for me, I can give myself all of the advice that I have because it's all right here. Mm. And I've taken like all the knowledge that I've got. And who's someone who, after listening to this podcast, might reach out to you? Describe that person and what are their main, main issues? Say you're posting and you're doing little advertisements on Instagram per se, mm -hmm. but you're getting more engagement, but nobody's sticking around to follow. These are the kinds of people that I'm best suited to help because I have all the advice on how to get over those kinds of things. And I guess if you're having like low engagement also, I could definitely really help with that. Or if you're having trouble gaining followers just in general, I could really help with that. For you moving on in social media, what are the biggest challenges that you think you need to stay on top of? What is changing? When you said before that, you know, things had changed, you know, you had to get back into it from age nine to then obviously 19. Uh, what about now? Where do you see social is going? I definitely say short form, which is like, shorter videos or like just images in short succession, those are getting a lot more traction. But like sites like TikTok, for example, yeah. which is the hottest thing this year, uh, I could see them getting shut out of the app store very soon because of their involvement with the Chinese government mm -hmm. and their security practices. They have been banned in India already. And I guess some of the biggest challenges would be keeping up with sites before something bad happens and everybody quits yeah. and trying to stay on top of what's the next big thing. So it's all trend forecasting. I would yeah. say that's the hardest part is just trying to stay on top of everything before it's too late. Yeah. Because everything has a really good entrance window and a really good exit window, but you have to be able to see that in the right time. 
I think that's incredibly good advice because that's it. You put, you know, most people are comfortable, you know, one, two, three or four platforms and they use them for different reasons and you put your whole heart and soul and get a following in that. And that's right. You, you know, it'd be terrible to have, you know, a massive Facebook community and then suddenly everybody leaves Facebook and then you don't have that or, or Instagram or Twitter or whatever. So understanding that these social platforms have a cycle or a lifetime. Uh, and so one, it's the demographic you know where is your demographic at um, and meeting them there but also realizing you've got to be watching the trends that is definitely such good advice I would say yeah terrific all right so who mentors you how do you learn this information is it purely through your degree do you have mentors in this space as well well, I do a lot of independent research. I do research online. I do research in books. I do research in marketing platforms. I also have mentors in my life, such as Mike Rohr. He's an entrepreneur in the space near where I live. And mm -hmm. he is actually the entrepreneur in residence at the college that I went to. Right. Along with one of my former professors, Professor Luglio, Rose Luglio. She is so kind. She's like part of the family now. She's practically so close. And those are my mentors and they've really taught me almost everything I need to know for the business end of everything for entrepreneurship and business and everything just related to that. Yeah. What has been your biggest learning that you could share? Hmm. I would definitely say if you're good at something, never do it for free. <laughs> yeah. How were you burned in that way? I've had people take free consultation calls and go on for an hour and a half and then grill me the entire time and get me to try to spill like secret formulas that I have for this or like business secrets for that. And I've given away so much free advice that I feel like I've given away more free advice than I've given paid advice <laughs> at the end of the day. Although some of that comes from mentoring business students myself. And that I'm happy to give away free advice, sure. but to people that I've met in the business space, they, I've been pressed for so much free advice mm. that people have been kind of inconsiderate to me before that I've really not appreciated. Yeah. Oh, thank you for being open and honest about that. Cause I think that is a key issue for so many people that you need enough of a conversation to obviously progress in a business, business fashion, but you also, um, you know, you'll get other people who are just looking for the quick, quick information and can push you. And, and it really doesn't value, it doesn't value you as a human being, as a, as a woman and, and value your time and expertise. There's many levels of that. And so it's interesting that you, yeah, you've, that's been your biggest learning and, and it is hard it's hard when you're passionate about this space and happy to give out information that you have learned but it's also taken you that's right a, you know a decade of um, tireless effort to acquire that information yeah and another key learning that I've done is never let men talk down to you just because you're a young woman like I've been made to feel like I should be an intern somewhere doing work for free just because I'm so young and I'm just a, just a woman in air quotes. <laughs> like I remember interviewing for this executive position somewhere and like I was bullied from the second that I walked in just because the guy said that he had a bias against freelancers mm. and that I just seemed so young that I wasn't worth my weight and in, like information. <laughs> Yeah. So how do you back up against that? Tell me what is it, an empowered young woman? How do you fight back on that? I guess for me, it took some time to realize my own self-worth and where I stand in this society and how much value I can bring to the table. And knowing how valuable I am and how much I have to be proud of, that really backs me up and helps me stand tall against people that talk down to me. Very good advice. Very good advice, because you will find it over and over again, particularly when, yeah, when you are young. It's easy when, you know, when you're older to actually go, oh, my gosh, you're so young. How could you have learned all of that so quickly? But that's right. But you've grown up a digital native. And so, you know, it's one, it's, it's, it's not something to learn. It's actually something that you already you had and, and then you, you crafted into a level of expertise. So where to from here? Where do you see your career going? Hmm. I'm actually working on a book and I'm hoping to sell that. It's about social media for business. 
And I'm hoping I don't make it too long by accident because I love to write and I might just accidentally write a textbook and some <laughs> work. I'm also hoping to become a public figure. And so far this being a social media expert and influencer is just a stepping stone to becoming a public figure, figure in the future. And yeah. I'm hoping to use my status as an influencer to grow my platform and my knowledge of social media to elevate myself through the internet and become a star someday. <laughs> a girl's got a dream. Well, you're well on your way. What's the difference for you from being um, an, an influencer to being a public figure? What does that mean to someone your age? What do you have to do? I guess for being an influencer, it's mostly just the internet. And for being a public figure, it's real life status. Having that kind of prestige in real life that mm. you have power and influence to help people in a way that's more than just over the internet. Yeah, sure. So it's more rounded. Okay. So what are you hoping if you could crystal ball, you know, you're suddenly 50 years old like me, what would you hope to have achieved? What does success, a successful career for a woman in business, what does it look like for you um, with what you're wanting to do? I guess for me, it would be having kind of a position of power where I'm able to make a difference in the world, where I can really help people and having the money to get into the kind of philanthropy that I want to get into, where I donate to as many charities as I can that are all for good causes. And just being able to help make a change in the world that'll last longer and leave me a legacy of positive memories. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, I think you're well on your way to doing that because you've been very intentional in your journey. Uh, you found out at a very young age what, what you're interested in and what, what makes you um, happy and excited, which is fashion. You've then crafted that and learnt your own, own craft in that way. And now you followed it up with your, your degree and writing a book, uh, definitely getting out there on podcasts and um, really claiming this space. I think you're, a, you're an interesting young lady to uh, keep watching. I think you're really going to um, do great things as a social media public figure in the future. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, thank you for being on my program. It's been really great to have a chat with you today. And uh, I look forward to watching your star rising. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Memoirs of Successful Women. You can find me at anniegibbons.com where you can download my free resources, get connected on social and check out my online magic transformation program. If you love this show, feel free to subscribe to future episodes and of course, share it with your friends. I'll see you again soon. And until then, happy podcasting.